If you're looking for a large luxury three-row vehicle, but you don't want something that's as big, as difficult to park, and as ponderous in terms of handling as a Navigator, an Escalade, or a Wagoneer, then you want to take a look at the Mercedes-Benz GLS. This competes in a phone booth size segment with the BMW X7 and the new Range Rover three-row. Before we continue, let's set the stage for the GLS. The very first generation model was designed as a replacement for the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon, the original military Mercedes, the very boxy one. Except that that boxy Mercedes continued to sell, so over the next two generations, Mercedes decided to refocus the GLS on being a big and luxurious, family-friendly three-row vehicle with a lot of off-road capability still, because again, the original intent was to be able to replace that Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. But this is not the same formula that we find in the S Escalade, the Navigator, or the Wagoneer, because this is a unibody SUV, like the BMW X7 and the three-row Range Rover. And price category-wise, this is right in line with those options. This starts just under $80,000, so significantly more than something like an Audi Q7, and it gives you a lot more room on the inside. But because of its unibody design, it's a lot more compact than something like an Escalade or a Navigator, even though it has about the same kind of room inside. You'll notice as I'm standing next to it, the hood is not up to my shoulder blades. It's a lot easier to park, to get in and out of, to get into a garage, to get out of a garage, etc. You'll notice that it is not as wide as some of those options either. That is going to limit some of the interior dimensions, but again, make it easier to live with. Up front, it definitely looks like a modern Mercedes with that absolutely enormous star logo there, and of course, some of their latest LED multi-module headlights here. With an overall length of 206.4 inches, this is three inches longer than a BMW X7, and most of that goes to the inside where we find more room than we find in the BMW, and it's a full foot longer than the Mercedes-Benz GLE. The GLE is available with a teeny tiny third row. This is always going to have the third row standard, and it is always going to be significantly roomier than that Mercedes GLE. That's the reason you want to get the GLS. This is almost exactly the same size as the new three row Range Rover. Versus the American body on frame competition, this has a much lower roof line and a much lower step in height because we don't have that frame below the body. The body and the structure of the vehicle, they're all one piece. So the step in height here is really only about maybe 12, 14 14 inches off the ground. It is considerably easier to get in and out of than the Navigator or the Escalade. But on the inside, we have about the same kind of room. And that's really why this looks smaller than the others. It's simply because the box is closer to the ground, even though we have about the same kind of ground clearance. You just don't have that frame in the way. The packaging efficiencies in a unibody vehicle like this are very obvious in the packaging of the cargo area in the back and the third row area where we find very similar room to those larger full-size SUVs in a much easier to park package. As you'd expect, out of a dedicated three-row vehicle, we have a pretty vertical rear hatch here, although the glass does not open separately. I'm a little disappointed that Mercedes didn't give us that feature because that would really improve the practicality. Full LED taillights, just as you'd expect, well-integrated exhaust tips down there, but no hitch receiver standard here under that plastic section of the bumper. You can get one. This is rated to tow well over 7,000 pounds, 7,700 pounds to be exact. But that is one of the reasons you might want to take a look at a body on frame vehicle. It's going to be a lot quieter to tow a big trailer because of the way the isolation works between the frame and the body in the vehicle. And towing capacities in full-size alternatives will go all the way up to 10,000 pounds, significantly higher than the GLS. But this is ready to tow more than the average mid-size pickup truck, so definitely still very capable. Since we're currently in the second half of 2022, you might be wondering, what is 2023 going to bring for the GLS? Well, we already know some of the details. The price tag is likely going to be a little bit higher. It's going to get a restyled front bumper, although it appears to be just the bumper, not the hood or quarter panels or anything like that. It's also going to get a new rear bumper, a new steering wheel, likely borrowed out of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, and the software on the screens on the inside is going to get a bit of a refresh, but the screens themselves and the rest of the interior, it looks like that's going to remain the same. The engine lineup is also going to be the same, although there could be some slight adjustments to the horsepower figures here and there. That's basically what we know for 2023 at the moment. Under this hood, we find one of my absolute favorite engines. If we lived in a weird world where I could build a car using parts from any manufacturer out there, the engine I would select would be this one. It's a three liter inline six producing 362 horsepower and 369 pound feet of torque. That power is delivered not just thanks to a turbocharger, but also a mild hybrid system. Between the engine and transmission, we have a pancake electric motor. 
This is a mild hybrid technically, but it's less mild than other hybrids out there because this has the ability to disconnect the engine and turn it off when you're rolling down the road. So if you're coming to a stop or you're just slowing down or coasting, it can turn off the engine to save power. Now, of course, if you need to move again, it has to turn on the engine because the electric motor cannot drive the vehicle along in its own right. A little bit more of a twist, though, versus most mild hybrids out there is the fact that this has an electric air conditioning compressor, thanks to a bigger battery pack and more oomph from the lithium ion pack itself. That allows it to drive the AC compressor with the engine off at stoplights. And that's one of the big problems with most mild hybrids out there. You roll up to a stoplight, you're in Houston, the engine turns off and you start reaching for that auto start stop disable button immediately because I need my air conditioning on. I don't blame anybody for that process. With this vehicle, you don't need to do that because the air conditioning will keep running. Now, if you want more power, there's a four liter V8, of course, with turbochargers and the same mild hybrid system that bumps power up to 516 horsepower. And if that's still not enough for you, there is a GLS 63 that bumps things all the way up to 627 horsepower and 603 pound-feet of torque. That is, as you might expect, going to be the fastest version of the GLS available and pretty exclusive in this segment. That's significantly more powerful than the Range Rover, and there is no BMW X7M for some reason. As you'd expect out of a Mercedes, front seat comfort is excellent. This is a nearly base model. This has only about $6,000 of options on it. That may sound ridiculous, but when we're talking about the GLS, this goes way up over six figures. We have a powered tilt telescopic steering column. It's memory linked to a three position memory over there on the door. We have an extending thigh cushion, four way adjustable lumbar support, heated and ventilated front seats, but no power adjustable pedals. If you're a shorter person and you're looking for that kind of option, you're only going to find that on the American alternative. Second row comfort is a big advantage for the GLS, especially over the body on frame competition. The step in height is much lower, making it a lot easier for people with mobility issues or smaller children to get into the second row themselves. This is the kind of vehicle where if you had kids in child seats, they could get up into the child seats themselves years before they would be able to do that in some of those higher off the ground body on frame options. Also, we find tons of headroom here. I have about three inches of headroom left. This is best in class when it comes to headroom, even including those luxury body on frame entries. Lots of legroom here, 117.8 inches combined. That is a little bit lower than the body on frame competitive set, but you're probably not going to notice the difference. You will, however, notice the difference when it comes to the width of the second row. This is simply not as wide as the body on frame competition because those are based on half ton truck designs and they just tend to be wider than the GLS. Obviously, there's going to be a trade off when it comes to ease of parking. And because of the design of this vehicle, it's really trying to make those footwells lower and the step in height lower. There is a hump right here in the center and you are going to have to step over that to get back there into the third row. Now, speaking of getting into the third row, we have a little red piece of webbing here. You pull on that, the seat folds forward right like that, but it does not fold and tumble because these are powered second row seats. There's some controls right over here on the door and you can power slide it forward and power tilt it forward as well. It's still not going to get you back there into that third row. You do have to pull that webbing and then try and jump over everything. It is a little awkward to get back there. Jumping into the third row is pretty easy because we have a power tilt slide second row seat on the passenger side. Now, you'll only find this on the passenger side again, not on the driver's side for some reason. Although this is going to be the side where if you're parallel parking, that's where the sidewalk will be. With this seat design, you can leave a child seat latch anchored into place and still tilt and slide it forward for easy access to the third row but this mechanism does take some time. It is not exactly the speediest. So if you live in a really wet area, you should know that you're going to be waiting a while in the rain for that seat to do its thing. And then of course, for it to do its thing back into position. Important thing to note, you have to have the door open for this seat to move in this manner. If I were to fully close this back door, then the seat would just be stuck into position. And again, driver's seat does not do that same thing. This is one of the few vehicles that has four full set of child seat anchors. So two latch anchors below, top tether anchor for all four seating positions. Now there are just four seating positions back here in this vehicle. This third row bench is just two seats only. It's a 50-50 design, but it is very roomy. I have about an inch and a half of leg room there. My legs are not just sitting on the floor here, and I have about an inch to an inch and a half of headroom sitting very upright with my head right there against that headrest. This is not the best third row in this segment, but it's pretty darn close. Of course, keep in mind that this GLS is a six seat vehicle only. So two seats up front, two seats in the middle, and then two seats right back here in the way back. No eight passenger version of the GLS exists because of the width of this third row bench. 
If there's one compromise for the GLS versus the American competition, it's the cargo area. It's still a pretty generous 17.4 cubic feet, so above the average midsize luxury three-row vehicle for sure, but not as big as the Navigator at 19 cubic feet, or the Escalade at 25, or the Wagoneer at 27. And that's before we even talk about the long wheelbase versions of those same three vehicles. If you get the long wheelbase new Grand Wagoneer L, that is quite a mouthful, Behind the third row seat, with the third row seat in position, you get more room than you will in this with the third row seats folded. It is a positively enormous vehicle. Obviously, it's going to come out several feet versus the GLS, make it a lot harder to park. Now, under this floor, we do find a temporary spare tire and just a tiny bit of additional storage space. It would be tricky to put six people and their luggage in here, but that is something you could do in the American competition. As we look around this interior, keep in mind this is a nearly base model of the GLS 450. So we have a pretty standard size moonroof right over the driver and front passenger's heads. No panoramic moonroof here. Height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger and four-way adjustable headrests, but no window shades or anything like that for the second row. We do, however, have lots of ambient lighting all around the cabin and lots of wood trim as well, including on those second row doors. But oddly, for a vehicle that's designed for the United States and built in the United States, we have some very small cup holders here. The second row seats have to share these two cup holders only. There are bottle holders in the second row doors, but no cup holders there. So we have one standard sized cup holder and one sort of itty bitty espresso cup holder. Moving back up to the front, this model has the imitation leather upholstery, but the front seats are perforated because these seats are both heated and ventilated. You can see that we have pretty aggressive bolstering on the front seats for the driver and front passenger. Lots of premium and soft touch materials going on on the front doors. We have wood trim there, metal speaker grills on the optional audio system this vehicle has. And you can see that we even have a three position memory over there on the passenger side. Lots of standard features even in the base trim, but also a few features that are oddly missing. For instance, this does not have a lot of the additional active safety features like adaptive cruise control that you might expect a luxury vehicle should have on it. Moving over to the dashboard, we have stitched upper sections of the dashboard. Remember, this is the SUV equivalent of the Mercedes Benz S-Class in essence, wood trim just below that, right there above that glove compartment, and you can see the ambient lighting strip running right across the dash. As with other Mercedes models, the ambient lighting is highly configurable. Moving inside the glove compartment, lots of room in there. It's a big bin style compartment. I had no problem fitting an 11 inch tablet in there. And then lots of soft touch materials down there along the bottom of the dashboard. Moving over to the dash itself, we have the two screen setup that we've seen in Mercedes models for a while. Infotainment screen over here, instrument cluster over there. This one is a touch screen. The one in front of the driver is not. As you can see, the screen supports smartphone integration, but the smartphone integration does not occupy the entire screen. It just occupies that center section. This is the same Mercedes-Benz infotainment system that we've seen out of them for a while. It's been slowly tweaked over time to give you easier access to things like Apple CarPlay, some direct access options there. We don't know what the reskin that's going to come from 2023 looks like, uh, but we do know it's not going to change the functionality of the system too greatly. It's mainly just going to be a restyle of it. Four large air vents here, easy to open and close with this little knob over here, and that knob opens and closes both of these air vents so the someone's in the center do open and close as well we have the engine start stop button there a button to disable the auto start stop system controls for the front two climate control zones this has a four zone climate control system a roller style cover there over this large storage area where we find a chi wireless charging mat two usb ports one of them will interface with the system the other one won't and then two very large cup holders right there easily able to accommodate large takeout drinks. This is the touch pad for controlling the system. I prefer not to use this. I would really love to know if anybody actually prefers using the touch pad here to work with the infotainment system. As we see in some other Mercedes models, there are three different ways to interact with the infotainment. You can use this as a mouse and then slide your finger around the options, or you can use this little Blackberry style track ball here to actually interact with those options as well. And there's a home button and a back button right there. Moving back over to the center console, we have other drive mode options. This is the drive mode selector here, 360 degree camera button. This takes us over to vehicle options in the infotainment system, mainly having to do with active safety systems, that sort of thing. Direct access for maps, navigation, volume control right there. It's a little wrist rest for using that touchpad controller. And this is the controller for the adaptive air suspension height. You can raise or lower it. This button opens this bifold center console. It's a little on the small side, but we do have some USB ports and there's just one right there and then a small storage area right there as well. 
At the top of the dashboard, we find a very large speaker grill, and if you got the optional heads-up display, there'd be a hole in it for the heads-up display. Over here, we have the highly configurable LCD instrument cluster. This is one of my favorites, but you should know that like other Mercedes-Benz infotainment systems, the operation of this software is pretty darn convoluted. If you wanna know more about this, I have a deep dive video into the MBUX infotainment system. I love the functionality set and the fact that you can adjust so many different things near so many different looks. But if you're looking for intuitive and easy to use, you might want to look somewhere else. Uh, however, I would take this over intuitive systems that didn't offer those functions. Over here on this side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the regular cruise control. Again, no autonomous cruise control or radar adaptive cruise control here. Paddles on the back of the steering wheel. This button and touch control controls that multifunction instrument cluster. This one again controls the infotainment system. Then we have a volume slider right there. Thanks to the combination of the turbocharger and the electric boost, zero to 60 happened in this pretty big Mercedes in a pretty impressive 5.7 seconds. One weird and interesting twist, the four liter V8 is certainly faster than this, but it's not that much faster, and that is somewhat surprising. I think it all has to do with the torque curve that we find on this three liter inline six and that electric motor boost. Now, again, kind of weird twist, the four liter V8 has essentially the same mild hybrid system as this, but because it has not quite as advantageous of a torque curve, even though the peaks are all higher, it goes zero to 60 in about 5.3 to 5.4 seconds. Definitely faster than this, but not as much faster as you might imagine. Now, if you wanna go really quick zero to 60, you can do that in about four seconds flat in the GLS 63. Before that model got the power bump, I clocked 4.1 seconds in it. So the new model has about 20 extra horsepower. It's probably right down there around four seconds seriously, seriously quick. Also a really excellent number is the stopping distance in this model, just 115 feet in this inline six model. That is a little bit shorter than the regular four liter V8, but obviously just a tiny bit longer than the GLS 63. The GLS 63 has a lot of added weight, but because it has really grippy tires, it's just below 110 feet. Both of those numbers are absolutely excellent. Any way you slice it, this is gonna be faster zero to 60 and stop quicker from 60 miles an hour back to zero and handle better than the body on frame competition. You can thank not just the design of this vehicle, but also the fact that it's got pretty wide tires, 275 with tires all the way around. Handling is absolutely excellent. And even though the cabin is serene, you can hear that inline six engine and it has a really, really great exhaust note. It's the kind of engine that you really wanna rev up to really hear that, that engine note. But of course, if you wanna drive it more sedately, you're not really gonna hear the engine at all. When it comes to handling, I'm gonna give this model an A. The X7 and the GLS are very, very close when it comes to handling ability. I prefer the feel in this a little bit over what we find in the X7, and I think a lot of folks do. But I have to say, I like the X7's interior, oddly enough, a little bit more. I haven't talked about that yet. I'll talk about that more in the comparison section, but the interior in the X7 is a bit more my taste, and I do like the V8 engine in the X7 just a bit more than the V8 that we get in the GLS, unless we're talking about the 63, of course. But in terms of raw handling ability, the two vehicles are very close and both are a step above the Escalade, the Navigator, and the Wagoneer. Primarily because this is a smaller, tighter vehicle and you don't have that sort of disconnection that you feel in a body on frame vehicle where the frame is going one way sometimes and it feels like the body is going another direction. Those vehicles are not exactly trucks with bigger boxes, but there is certainly a very close relationship between those manufacturers' full size trucks and the full size SUVs. And you can feel it out on the they feel much more truck-like than this. This feels like a very slightly overinflated GLE, and it's amazing how much bigger this is than the GLE, but how similar they feel behind the wheel. They both have a very similar steering feel, they both have a very similar handling capability and handling dynamic to them. This is obviously bigger, but it's more like the GLE than the average full-size SUV in the US. So if you're looking for something that drives smaller, feels smaller, but has tons of room in the back, that's why you might want this or the X7. Thanks to the air suspension, ride quality is excellent, even out on poorly paved surfaces or gravel roads like the one that I'm on here. This soaks up the large and small imperfections pretty well, and it's definitely more my taste than the air suspension that we find in the GLS 63. The 63 is just a bit too firm in my opinion. Even though this one has the AMG package on it, it's mainly a styling and wheel package, it does compromise the ride quality just a hair, but it's not an enormous amount. And any way you slice it, I would take the more typical version 
versions of the GLS over the 63 if you're really concerned about ride quality. Now, this is still a European vehicle, so it is still tuned towards the firmer side of things versus an Escalade or a Navigator or a Wagoneer, especially if you get the top-end suspension systems available in those big three American brands. The Cadillac has an especially civil ride because it's a combination of ferromagnetic damper and an airbag for air lift setup. That combination gives it an absolutely excellent ride quality and it's going to be the model that's A plus in this segment, but I still give this model an A minus. It's going to be a little bit firmer than those other options, but still very, very comfortable. In terms of cabin quietness at 50 miles an hour, I measured 69 and a half decibels in here, easily matching this with the quietest of the vehicles that I've ever tested. This has the optional acoustic package on it, so keep in mind that the absolute base GLS might be a little bit louder than this, but it's probably not going to be an enormous difference. The cabin quietness score is doubly impressive when you consider the fact that in the Escalade, the Navigator, and the Wagoneer, the body is isolated from the frame, and that's part of why they get to those excellent cabin quietness scores. And in this vehicle, they had a lot tougher of a challenge to make this as quiet with the more direct and connected feel that you get out of a unibody vehicle. Now, when it comes to fuel economy, I'm going to have to give this a B minus. There are rumors that the next GLS coming in 2023 might offer us a plug-in hybrid system. I'm really intrigued to see if they do that. I would really be interested in that because fuel economy in here, well, it's not exactly great. It's pretty similar, honestly, to the big full-size body on frame vehicles that this is competing with. This is EPA rated for 20 miles per gallon. The four-wheel drive system is standard on every model, but we don't have a two-speed transfer case. And even in alternatives in this segment that do, they're going to get right around the same fuel economy. I've been averaging 19.8 miles per gallon, pretty similar to what the EPA ratings say I should be getting, but you will find slightly better fuel economy in the competition, especially if you're willing to get a diesel engine in your Cadillac. That diesel Cadillac is going to be spectacularly efficient, especially out on the open highway, Diesel is obviously going to be a bit more expensive, but it's still going to be less expensive to operate than this GLS. I have to say the fuel economy number surprised me a bit because every other Mercedes that this engine has been in has been incredibly efficient, and I had expected this to be a little bit more efficient than it really is, especially keeping in mind the fact that this has the mild hybrid system and right now I'm driving 50 miles an hour, the engine's not even on. Again, it's very aggressive at turning off the engine. If I press on the accelerator pedal, it's going to turn the engine back on and then I'll keep my speed up here. But if it's a very gradual downhill slope, uh, like we're gonna experience here in just a moment, I can take my foot off the accelerator pedal, engine turns off and it just coasts along, trying to save as much fuel as possible. But again, even so, fuel economy is not great, likely due to the aerodynamics and the big tires that we have on this model. Bottom line, the GLS is an excellent full-size SUV out on the road. If you're looking for something that is sharper, feels more refined, has a quiet and isolated cabin, and is definitely a lot easier to maneuver in tighter parking lot and road situations, you want this over the Escalade, the Navigator, the Wagoneer, etc. If you get this out on your favorite winding mountain road, this instantly feels like a smaller vehicle. It is so much more fun than those other full-size SUVs, while giving you a very similar kind of room on the inside, and obviously a big presence out on the road as well. Now let's talk pricing. The GLS theoretically started at 77,850, but as tested, 84,960 was our price tag. And as I said before, this model didn't even have radar adaptive cruise control. The options get really expensive, really fast on the GLS. And if you start getting carried away with things like some of the trim packages, the blacked out packages, etc., you can really scale up that price tag quite rapidly. All the way loaded, fully loaded, a GLS 63 is going to set you back about $164,000. But if you want to spend even more, there is the Maybach version of the GLS, which is not on this chart because that definitely goes way off the other end. That compares pretty favorably, to be honest, with something like a Cadillac Escalade, which actually starts a little bit more expensive, but has more standard equipment. It doesn't get quite as expensive as the GLS 63, however, although there is now the supercharged version, which is an awful lot of fun. It also is interesting when you compare it against the new three-row Range Rover. This is an interesting twist for Range Rover. They haven't had a three-row model before, 
Hopefully I'll have my hands on that model very, very soon. There have been three row Land Rovers, but not a three row full on Range Rover. And you can see that this is in a different price category in a way also. It doesn't have the performance that we find in the GLS, but it gets pretty darn expensive and it starts a lot more expensive, starting at 110,500 for that three row model. Then of course we have the BMW X7, a very, very direct competitor against the GLS with honestly, a very, very similar pricing range. And if you want more power, there is no X7M, but there is an Alpina version of the X7, and that will get you up to there to the price and performance figures approximately that we see in the GLS 63. Now let's take a look at the pros and cons. I think that Mercedes did a good job with the design inside and out. I really love the attention to detail that we find inside the GLS. Although I have to admit, I think I like the interior design of the BMW X7 just a bit more. I also like the fact that Mercedes is giving us an array of different engine options right from the factory. With the X7, it's a little bit tricky because the Alpina model is sold through a BMW dealer, but they're technically sort of a tuning company, a, a quasi M brand, if you will. It's not that BMW is doing that, it's actually Alpina that is crafting that vehicle, but there's a BMW warranty and it's sold through BMW dealers. The GLS is a bit more spacious than the X7, and as far as legroom goes, it's not far off the body on frame competition. But any way you slice it, the Escalade, the Navigator, the Grand Wagoneer, they're going to be roomier inside. So if you are looking for a wider, more accommodating second row, a wider third row, and more cargo room, you're gonna find it in all of those other options. Also, the fuel economy could be better. For a mild hybrid vehicle, especially a pretty aggressive mild hybrid vehicle, you might expect 25, 26 MPG. Keep in mind the GLS is pretty big, so your real world fuel economy is gonna be right down there towards 20 miles per gallon. And then of course there is that price tag. If we're talking about value, pretty much everything else in this segment, except for something like the new Range Rover three row is going to be a better value. And at the end of the day, that is my only major problem with the GLS. And it might not be a problem for you if you can afford one and you really want that Mercedes logo on the hood, but you can get very similar content in the BMW X7 for less. I know not everybody is a fan of the look of the X7. Personally, I like the look outside of the X7 and I really like the look of the interior. It's a little bit more my taste, but as far as parts quality goes, it's very similar to the Mercedes. And in some areas, the Mercedes is a little bit above the X7 in terms of the kind of parts and, and finishes and things like that that Mercedes uses on the inside. But bottom line, it's hard to go wrong with the GLS or the X7. If you can afford one, either of them is gonna be less expensive than the average Range Rover three row rolling off the lot. Unless you're talking about performance versions, and if you are, then be sure and check out my video review of the GLS 63. I'll see all of you later.